Dornan is a graduate of Purdue University and an aerospace engineer by profession. He became an entrepreneur in 1970, has written bestsellers on business and personal development, and today owns companies on six continents. As technology develops and the world and local interests merge, Jim Dornan's articulation of global experience and today's opportunities draws an exciting future for the business innovations of the future. Here is Jim Dornan. So often it is a, a challenge in the area of belief, uh, which is kind of awkward uh, in a way, uh, particularly as I know I'm always talking to some new people. Belief seems kind of fluffy, you know, kind of uh, you know, too unspecific. Like, what does that mean? But it's so important in our kind of a business because in so many other professions, you all know I was an engineer, and so it doesn't really matter what you might be doing. So most of us work in professions where the skills really do matter, Even if you're, whether you're in construction, whether you're a dentist, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a, uh, a scientist or a professional athlete or tennis player, or, you know, pick a profession, a violinist. There's a lot of skill involved. There's a lot of education to get the foundation. Then there's many years often in developing skills, and many of those skills are not all that developable just because you want them. You know, I may want to be an NBA basketball player, but not a lot of chance of that. You know, there are a lot of things in life that, that, um, that are not like they are in this business, where you really do need skills that are elusive or, or, or basically out of reach. Sometimes age is the limit. Sometimes, you know, many things limit us in, in life. And we, we see successful people and we, we admire them, but we don't quite know what to do about it because we don't know how to get where they are. You know, we're, we're, we have barriers of money or education or age or, or, or so many things. So many times those barriers are just relatively insurmountable. Of course, they're not, not always totally insurmountable. But the difference, we come into this business, and, and it's exactly as Kale said. The big question first is, is this business worth bothering with, taking seriously, kind of carving out some of the uh, crowdedness in our life to make some room for this? That. That is more elusive than it should be. I mean, to me, if anyone who really researches this business, it ought to become so obvious that it's good. And I think it does with people that take any time to meet, to either really research it properly, not the, not the bathroom wall of the, of, uh, the Internet, but you know, really research it where you, where you look at people who, who know what they're talking about and, and have to be vetted a little bit before they just you know, speak their opinion. Um, you, you really would have trouble coming away from this from any, any kind of meaningful research and not being impressed with the business. And yet so many people discard it daily because of what they think it is or what they've heard it is or what they've experienced with somebody else. Um, somewhere along the line, I started to say belief. So this belief thing really hits me because all over the world where I go, it seems like I'm talking more about helping people not only outside the business but inside the business really recognize that you have something here that you really can do more with than you probably are and you probably should be doing more with it than you are. But what's the problem? The problem is we're afraid that if we committed ourselves or worked hard, it might not actually work because there's just no guarantee. We see people all around us that appear to be trying to build it and they're not succeeding. And we're thinking, well, we don't want to be one of those people. You know, it's, it's easier to justify your lack of success if you never say you were really committed, either to somebody else or to yourself. It's a bit of a scary thing to say, you know what, I've checked this thing out. It's a doggone thing I've ever seen. It, I, I want this. I'm, I'm going to do this. And then suddenly it's like, what if I don't? I mean, it's bad enough to fail at, like, real estate, but failing at Amway, how embarrassing. <laughs> because there's this, there's this perception that anyone who would, was willing to do Amway could, Right? There's a perception in the world that Amway is like just a matter of willing, not it doesn't there are no can't be any, and we perpetuate that by saying it doesn't take any real talent and no, but sometimes these attitudes are harder to get than the talents. They're gettable, but they're they're scary. It's scary to to, to become more expectant, to set goals, to to be positive when it's more fun to be negative and cynical, and it's much more fun to blame somebody else for our problems. I, I love the story of the guy I used to tell years ago, um, one of my favorite uh, communicators and leadership trainers, Charles Tremendous Jones, if any of you have ever heard him. He tells this great story about two construction guys, and they sit down every day for lunch, and they have uh, uh, open a lunchbox, and one guy opens the lunchbox every day, and he goes, oh, no, peanut butter sandwich again. I hate peanut butter sandwiches. And the other guy says, well, geez, you know, and the next day he sits down again, oh, no, peanut butter sandwiches. I hate peanut butter sandwiches. Third day, oh, no, I hate peanut butter sandwiches. And finally the guy says, Charlie, Charlie, if you hate peanut butter sandwiches so much, 
why don't you tell your wife to fix something else? He says, you leave my wife out of this. I pack my own lunch. <laughs> and I've always remembered that one because it's funny, but it's not funny. Because we do pack our own lunch. But we complain about it as though someone else packed it. And, and we do those things. It's natural for us to do those things. We don't even hear ourselves doing them. And so we come into this business world, first thing we recognize, and I mentioned this to the guy yesterday, um, we're dealing with people that in most cases are not, not used to being in business, they're not used to being in sales, they're not used to being in leadership positions, and they're not used to having to manage their own time. They're not used to having only a, their only boss being themselves. Most of us are used to employers telling us what to do, when to show up, and how much they're going to pay us. I don't mean that that's bad. I mean, I've got employees, too, and they, I expect them to be in, and I expect them to do certain tasks, and I expect them, and, I, and I, we have an agreement. I'll pay them when they do that because it, it has great value, whether it's our accountant or our lawyers or our you know, uh, product people that ship things or customer service people. There's nothing wrong with what they do. But suddenly, if they find themselves in business, we tell them what activities and attitudes are, 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 and skills are required for success, and then we step back and watch and see if they'll do it. And they often don't do it, even though they could do it, even though they want the money, even though they say they want, you know, a better life or more money or new house or, you know, a million other things that people always kind of want. And then you, you show them how to get it. You tell them what they need to do. They're capable of doing it, but they don't do it. And sometimes they don't do it because they're afraid. They're afraid of failure. They don't have enough confidence. Uh, they don't have enough belief is what it keeps coming down to. And the longer you're in the business, you realize it's not about just product knowledge and plan knowledge and company knowledge. And, and uh, it's more about getting people to a point where they actually understand it enough that they will treat it more seriously and actually decide they're going to learn it and believe in the business, its, its value, the rewards it can produce, and believe that if they, go th if they do the basic things they will get results. It's amazing how hard people are willing to work if they believe there are results. We, we always do these experiments with our group, like messing with our brains with each other. If we put you all on a contract for the next 90 days, and if we told you all we're going to ask you to do is show the plan to somebody every day, you're going, <gasps> we'll provide the people. I mean, we'll get the appointments for you. You just show the plan every day and use the products, and um, at the end of the month, we'll pay you $5,000. We'll do that for three months in a row. If you don't show the plan every day, we don't pay you anything. But if you just show it every day, and we'll provide the people for you to show it to, then, you know, you'd... I don't know anybody wouldn't do that. I mean, it takes an hour. It takes an hour. We, we set the appointment up. You could do it over the Internet. You could do it one-on-one. -on -one. You could bring them to a meeting. You just got to make sure every day somebody sees this plan, and we'll give you $5,000. Nobody minds doing the work. They're just afraid if they start, what happens to people, they start doing the work, they start believing, and then two or three people say no, and they go, oh, it doesn't look like it's going to work, and all the energy goes out of them because the belief slips. And when the belief slips and the doubt comes up, then, then it doesn't look worth doing anymore. Then you kind of feel like a fool. Then you kind of you, you say, well, maybe I shouldn't want this so much. Maybe I don't really need that extra money anyway, like the guy that told me years ago that he didn't want to build a business because he and his wife figured if they made all that extra money, all they'd do is spend it. It was a little hard to argue with that, but I never forgot it. It was one of, those, it was one of the more kind of showstoppers in, uh, in excuses that I got. We made all that money. And they always say it a certain way. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, we made all that money. Figure out all we do is spend it. So, yeah, we figure no point. I don't, know, I don't know how to process that. I mean, I just don't know how to process that. So, um, so we do a lot of this stuff, and we, try it, we do it with humor. We do it with different personalities. We do it with CDs. We do it with meetings. Belief is this real elusive, fragile thing. When you have it, you have it, and when you don't, you don't, and it's kind of fragile. And therefore, if you want to know where the big uh, determiner is of uh, you know, success and not success, it so often revolves around your ability or your discipline, your willingness to, to keep yourself into an environment, to, to control what goes into your head, what you think about, who you talk to, to where you can believe long enough, keep doubt away long enough that you get some results, and then the results start to feed your belief. Just a little bit of results, you know, a $50 check, a $200 check, a, a little recognition for something, and you go, gee, I didn't do very much. And then suddenly it occurs to you, 90% of the people in the audience didn't even do what you did. I mean, you didn't do very much, you're right. You know, you, in this group, you know, you, you reorder and we, you give you a standing ovation. <laughs> really, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing how easily you can get recognized here. But the amazing thing is, 
And Kale, he just made a very clever leadership point that as a leader, what you do visibly is almost more important than what you do. It's kind of like people say, well, you know, should, should you eat neutralized vitamins? Yeah. When do you eat them? Well, with each meal. Wrong, wrong answer. That's a right answer, but it's also the wrong answer. When do you eat neutralized? In front of your downline. You know, I mean, when do you eat neutralite? When somebody sees you eating them. Because, because you, you know, the point is, in our business world, we're constantly make, trying to make sure people know we're not telling them to do something that we're not doing. We're simply modeling it and sharing and challenging them or, or asking them or inviting them to. Uh, you want to get the easiest way, in my mind, to prospect people these days is just walk into a restaurant with a bottle of perfect water or a can of access and put it on the table. That's all you have to do. I defy you to find someone that won't ask you what that is. I've never seen it happen. I've never put an excess or perfect water on a table in a restaurant and had the waitress ignore it. Usually people from four tables over go, what's that you got? It's unbelievable how it attracts attention. I don't think I would ever ask those questions. But people cannot let you drink something they've never seen without wondering what it is. And, and perfect water is, it creates questions. Perfect, what's that? It's a perfect water. Perfect water. Well, what? And you tell them about oxygenation, and then they go, where do I get that? They always say, where do I get that? Excess. It looks so great. They always say, what's that? Where do you get that? I mean, it's just so simple if you are you know, doing that. I'm off the track here a little bit, but I got excited. You know, they don't have trouble with belief. I think the reason they're successful is not they don't have more time. They don't know more people. They're not better communicators. They're not, they don't have any advantage. Mom and dad, they can hardly find anybody upline from them that will help them. Because mom and dad, in both Kelnada's case and Dave and Jewel's case, are always gone somewhere, enjoying the fruits of their labor rather than helping their poor downline kids build the business. But the reason they're so amazingly effective is they have such belief. It's not some weirded out belief. It's belief like, what do you mean you don't think it works? I lived it. I've grown up in it. I, you know, all my all my friends are diamonds. And my I mean, my uncles and aunts are diamonds. My all the houses and cars and all the f- travel and vacations I've ever taken since I was a baby are all paid for by Amway. It's like, what do you mean it doesn't work? It's so crazy for them, and yet their their belief simply comes from their observation of reality. It's not a bunch of smoke and mirrors. It's actually what happened. But if you're wondering where your hesitations might be or whatever, don't let yourself get bogged down in thinking this is about waiting until the timing is right or waiting for your upline to be right or waiting for a downline to be ready or, or, or waiting for the next right product to come out or the right bonus to come out or the right advertising to come out. It's never about that. It's about finally just jumping in the water and getting wet. It's just not that complicated. If you, if you really do enough research that you realize, okay, okay, he's right. It, it really does work. They really do pay the money. They aren't, most of the people aren't that weird. Uh, really pretty normal. They're pretty much like me. They had some fears. They don't, they don't work 100 hours a week. You just do certain things over and over, not scary things, not complicated to learn things. But you, you stop doing them when you stop believing they're going to pay off. And we do have that one dilemma, and that is in our business, you get paid for results, not effort. That's both good news and bad news. It's, it is both good and bad, you know. I mean, it, it's bad because if you work hard and don't get any results, you don't get any money. What that really means is you just need to practice a little bit more. You should get a little bit better. I mean, uh, it, it, just like when I start playing golf, you know, I, no matter how many times I swing, if I don't swing right, the ball's not going to go where I want it to go. It's not the ball's fault. I, I, just have to, I just have to learn it. But I can learn it. I keep telling myself that anyway. I can learn it, you know. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's just practice. And... Uh, and listening to a few basic tips. And in our business, it's not rocket science to share with people a business. Most of the people that join us don't join us because the plan's done great. They join it because the person showing it seems to believe what they're talking about. And people sense that sincerity. They don't remember the numbers anyway. Who does? You know? Um, and so I just, it's that belief thing is such a basic uh, element. So in this sort of leadership type uh, environment here, what are some of the things that really make a difference? And I, this, I, I don't want to get real specific in this first couple of points, and I want to make a, a couple of points before I leave. Number one, you really do need to make sure you have a clear picture of the business and where you want to go with it. I, I know that sounds like step one obvious, and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, I got that. You know, most people don't have that. I'm in a really clear picture of what it is that you want your business or your life to look like a month from now, a year from now, five years from now. I know it's hard, but if you don't, Start thinking about where you want to go. I used to say it this way. If you don't change directions, you'll end up where you're headed, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, I like what Nancy says. If you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even more. <laughs> if, you, if you hate change, you'll hate irrelevance even more. Um, 
but I don't know. We, we don't know. I, I assume if you're in this room, there's something about the business that intrigues you. You either, it's real obvious, like you just want more money, or you want, you want some ownership, you want some options. Um, you know, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want more money these days? Who wouldn't want $500 a month, 1000 Certainly, who wouldn't want a $20,000 check? You know, something like 4,000 people got that check this year just here in North America. I mean, this is not like it's not working. There's plenty of money being made. It's being made pretty quickly these days. But you kind of get this clear picture. And it's not only true in our business. It's true in everything we do. It's just the way um, life works. Uh, I used to tell some, I used to tell you stories about the importance of getting a clear picture by using examples of, of the houses that we ended up buying. It, was so, 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 some, it took me so long to learn these lessons. My wife, um, dear Nancy, she's had no trouble with this. You know, she sees something. She's like that. I immediately think of all the... It's the engineer curse of the engineer, the analytical mind or whatever. You know, it, it takes you twice as long to get anything done because you've got you to gotta think of every possible way it could go wrong and analyze it to death while people that don't think about all those details just go out and make the money. And so uh, we would be, you imagine how successful we would have been if I had just listened to my wife in the early days instead of told her all the reasons why she was naive. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, naivety is very, very underrated, I'm t- trust me. It's one of my goals now is to become more naive. Um, but anyway... I remember she used to talk all the time. We had a trip to Hawaii. I'm trying to remember what year that was. Dave, you must have been three or four. We went to Hawaii, and we rented a house on the beach right by Diamond Head for a month, and they had a ball. But there was a house just a few doors down that we used to walk by on our walks in the morning that really stunned us. It was like probably a 8,000-square-foot house on about two acres right on the ocean right by Diamond Head. And what we loved about it is this beautiful house with this big deck and this beautiful mowed lawn, which you don't see a lot in Hawaii, like a grass lawn, and then the sand and then the water. And I remember Nancy saying, that's what I want. I want a house with a deck, and then I want grass, sand, and water. And I thought, okay. And I, I got the point. I mean, you know, you look at this house, it just, there was something about the mowed lawn right after the, right after the beach. So often beaches are kind of scrubby and scruffy, you know, and so you – or, or – and, and, so anyway, she liked that whole combination of the look like a park, and then it was the beach, and the water, and the deck. And the, for like the next 15 years, all she talked about is grass, sand, water. And we'd, everywhere we'd go, we'd dream about We'd go look at a house. It would have grass and no water. It would have sand and no grass. It would have no deck. And it, we couldn't find anything. We really weren't seriously looking, but we always kept thinking, if we ever find grass, sand, water, we've got to have it. Finally, one day, uh, about 10 years ago, we were in Florida, and uh, they said, Terry, says, I found grass, sand, water. And I thought, yeah, right. Anyway, they took us to this house on whatever it was, a, a little more than an acre, 165 feet of ocean front, right on about a 15-mile beach in Florida. And, she, and, and Nancy walked out on the deck, looked at the deck, the grass, the sand, and the water, and bought the house. Well, she bought the deck. She remodeled the whole house. but <laughs> She bought the deck, the grass, the sand, and the water, right? But we didn't still learn our lesson. A couple of other short stories, because I want to make a point with this. A few years Many, many years ago, when we were new in our business, we, I had just started to really start growing. We bought a house in Southern California, and we went looking to one of these new home developments for this house. And we found a house that Nancy, just, the floor plan she loved, and a lot she loved. And she wanted this. She said, I want that one. And the sales guy says, no, that one's sold. It was one of the first ones bought in the neighborhood. You can't have that one. She says, no, I want that one. She says, it's sold, ma'am. And I'm thinking, he doesn't know my wife. Anyway... Finally, he convinced her to buy the one next door. Well, convinced us. You know, I'm like, I don't care. They both find to me. She says, I want that one. Okay, we'll buy this one, the one next door. It wasn't one she wanted, but it was close enough. About two months later, as they're starting to build the houses, she's over visiting somebody that was actually a retail client of ours that was buying some kind of products in the neighborhood that she had been referred by one, somebody. And she was telling her how we had bought a house in this neighborhood. And the girl says, oh, we bought a house in that neighborhood too. And they says, what, what one did you buy? And she describes it, and it was the house Nancy wanted. So this lady that she meets is actually the one that has the deposit on the house that Nancy wanted. She nearly choked her right there, but she controlled herself like, oh, really? I'm so excited for you. Urgh. So excited for you. And the lady says, yeah, but, you know, it's really disappointing. I just found out I'm going to have another baby, so it looks like we're going to have to cancel that order. Nancy goes, really? She runs back over to the sales office after she leaves the neighbor's house, and she puts a deposit check down uh, for the house. She says to the guy, I still remember the salesman's name, Bob Brown. still remember this guy. And she puts a deposit down on poor old Bob Brown's desk, and he goes, what's that for? She says, it's for that house. She says, I told you it's sold. She says, no, the lady's going to come back this afternoon and cancel it, and I, I want it. He goes, no way. He says, she's been visiting that house every day. 
She was the first person in here. She is not going to cancel. Dan says, watch out, watch. I'm, I'll be, you call me when she comes in. Sure enough, a couple hours later, the guy calls and says, how'd you know that? How'd you know that? <laughs> anyway, it's just a, it seems like just a funny story, but I should have learned by then. Yeah. Then a few years later, we decided we wanted to move to San Diego. So we found that we went down with Dan and Nancy. They showed us a house in San Diego, sitting up in Point Loma, overlooking San Diego Harbor, overlooking the Yacht Club. Unbelievable view. If you've ever seen a poster of San Diego with the harbor and the city skyline, that was taken basically from that house. And so it was just like this phenomenal house. We looked at it, and the guy told us the price. And I went, whoa, that's way too much. I said, that's a million dollars more than I want to pay for a house. And so she says to me as we're going out, maybe they'll drop the price a million dollars. <laughs> I said, honey, I don't think so. So we go, we forgot all about it. A year later, we started to decide, well, we really need to look for a house again on the water. Let's go try again. And uh, so she says, why don't you call those people for that house we looked at a year ago? I said, honey, houses don't stay in the market for a year. See, here's me again telling her. Houses don't stay in the market for a year. She said, just call them. Just, just humor me. So I called the person that was selling the house. And I said, is that house still in the market? She said, as a matter of fact, we just lowered it a million dollars yesterday. <laughs> what? <laughs> ah, so we bought that house and we moved to San Diego. I mean, this is like weird. And, and so, you know, we, we had this picture. We, and by the way, for that whole year, we were just kept talking about that house. Wish it was cheaper. Wish it was a million dollars cheaper, you know. I give you story after story, and that's why this airplane that we just bought is so funny. Because I've been dreaming about an airplane for a long time. But, you know, it's a lot of money. And, you know, boy, you know, private jets, that's just kind of a whole different world. And I kept thinking, ah, I shouldn't really do that. I'll, and I go back and forth, and I look at the cost of a jet, and I go, woo, you know. Then I come back again, and I I just I just have this. And then every now and then the company would fly me around in their private jets, and I'd get the dream would come back alive, and I get frustrated again because I I mean every house we've got, you know, we've caused somebody to have a baby, somebody had to lose a million dollars, another one had to lose a job, the financial world had to collapse, so I could afford the jet. You have to be very careful what you dream about, <laughs> and it it you know it, it it is a bit funny, but it's not as funny as I used to think it was. It's just strange how powerful goals and dreams can be, and I find so few people do that anymore. They just don't do it. In the, in the world you live in, it's just not cool. It's not talked about. It's it just they don't do it. They don't get a clear picture of what they want and then start focusing on it in, in all these areas. And it doesn't have to be areas of material things. It can be all kinds of It can be even things like a happy marriage or kids or you know, all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be that. And I'm not trying to talk about some, you know, forgive me for this, but some new age hocus pocus of controlling the universe. That's not what I'm talking about either. It isn't what I believe. But, it, but it's more like just there's something about getting these clear pictures of things that helps you focus. It helps keep you directed. It helps keep you, um, and when you want something that badly uh, or you decide you, you, you want it, and, and you process all the other things, like it's not, you know, if you start thinking that's going to be, make you happy, then you've got other problems. So we have to, you have to come to one of our other seminars to remind you that having nice houses and lots of money doesn't make you happy either. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't make you sad either, necessarily, but it doesn't make you, it, it isn't going to be the answer to your issues. But first people have to do, my first point is this belief thing, and they need to learn how to start dreaming again, start setting some goals, start getting a clear picture where you want to go. That actually is where we lose a lot of people. We just lose a lot of people because they just can't get out of that old, old uh, habits and the, the um, lack of expectation and the unwillingness to actually think about what you really want versus what you think you deserve or what you think you can have based on the past. That's a tough one for a lot of people. And uh, I, I might say as, a, as an aside, even if you solve it, here's the next challenge. Everybody you recruit's got the same problem you might have had, and what doesn't work is just hitting them cold on and demanding that they get where you now are. One of the problems we've always had in this business is when we finally get to where we need to be, we want everybody else to get there instantly. You know, we might have taken six months to, or six years to think that Amway is even a worthwhile business, and then the minute we join, we want all our friends to think it's a worthwhile business right away. One of the great discouragements of this business is that some people just take time to process it. They need exposure. Maybe they need to try some product. Maybe they need to listen to some CDs. Maybe they need to come visit a meeting. Maybe they need just to feel like you're not trying to get them or trying to tell them what to think. And so one of the things is we work real hard to get you convinced, get you belief, get you excited, get you equipped. And then we've got to work hard on getting you to kind of put a governor on it, kind of pull it back enough so that you don't just turn a fire hose on people because they may not be 
probably aren't where you are. And now, you say, well, how do I ever get anything done? Well, find people that are not so hard as you were. Find people that are like my wife. Find people that just know what they want. They don't ask a million questions. They trust. Find people that are more ready. Find people that are more confident. Find people that don't have so many hang-ups as you and me might have had. And they will go right away. And the others might... You might be surprised, however. Sometimes the fast starters, the easy ones, do the least. Sometimes the tough, negative, tough starters, slow starters do the most. Even if I try to give you characteristics of a winner, it seems like every time we pick somebody that should do it and looks like they could do it, they don't. And then we pick people and we look at people that we think don't really need it and maybe don't even look like they could do it, and they do better. Uh, I, we, uh, I don't know if you've figured that out yet, if you've been around long enough. This business will terrorize you and fascinate you by how impossible it is to figure out who's going to go, that's the best thing I've ever seen, how do we get started? And who goes, yuck. And you can't figure it out. And it doesn't seem to be based on need. It doesn't seem to be based on, on anything logical because the things that cause people to connect with us is what's inside of them. It's a felt need for change. It's, a, it's some people, they start slow because they have low confidence. They have never experienced with this. They, they don't want to you know, move too quickly. But those people, those kind of deep water, those kind of slow burners, if you let them percolate a little, if you let them come around and use the stuff and get comfortable and get confident, they become incredibly infectious because when they start growing, people are going, whoa, if you can do it. <laughs> you know, it builds huge confidence when people that don't otherwise look like they got a motor mouth when, when the real confident, loud, long, fast talkers, like I've become over the years, when they talk, people kind of go, eh, maybe you, not me. But then the quiet people get up, and they just talk simply about what they're doing and the $20,000 check they got, and people go, wow. And so please don't miss the business because you're trying to compare yourself to the wrong people, or you're looking at the wrong things, or you're trying to rush it too much. We don't mind if you rush it. But we don't, also don't mind if you don't. We've always got a few that are ready now. And we always, are, we always got others in the, in, in the crock pot, just kind of waiting until they're hungry or ready or frustrated with uh, life as it is and decided, I'm going to jump in and get wet. I'm, I'm done with dancing around the outside, trying to make everything perfect. I'm just going to jump in, get wet, and do something, see what happens. So a lot of times you've got to adjust your thinking, of course. You know, that, that's, that's why we have so much in the Network 21 side. That's why we deal so much with attitude, with with personal development, we call personal development, developing your confidence, developing more, more your confidence than your skills. It's much more your attitudes than your skills. They're exactly right. The skills are just, they're just not that big of a deal. Give me one three-hour day, we teach you everything you need to know. Everything after that is just practice. It's, I used to use the analogy in golf all the time. I mean, you, there's a stance, there's a grip, and there's a swing. Eh, you know, you can watch a video, you can go to one lesson, you're done with learning golf. Really, you're done. The rest of your life, you try to figure out how to do what they just told you to do. Because it, it, the, the grip is the grip. You hold your hands like this, you're done. The stance is the stance. You don't stand like this. You don't stand like this. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a way to stand. There's a way to hold the club. And there's a way to swing. You're done with learning golf other than the rules of the game. But I may tell you, it's one of the most impossible skills to master. It's elusive. You can... You can Think you're doing it right, and the ball goes over here. Guess what? The ball did not go over there on its own. It went over there because you hit it over there. I have these talks with myself all the time, actually. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit like that in our business, if you're kind of wondering why it looks a little bit elusive to some of you. Because sometimes you think, well, I, that's what I told that person. I told them they ought to do this thing. It's just really great. And Really? That's nice, but that, that's not what I actually said. <laughs> that's what I said, but the way you delivered it, that, that's not working, you know. And so it, it takes some time to kind of learn how to relax, have a little bit of a sense of humor. You know, you get better. It's not rocket science. You know, it's just not. It's not that complicated. In fact, I, I think often new people recruit more people than experienced success, uh, you know, people. Sometimes you do better when you're in the beginning. You're, you're excited. You, you know, your, your friends look and go, geez, you know, if you can make a dollar, I can make ten doing that. So, um, but the, the main thing I wanted to just leave you with today, my, my kind of main thought would be, to re-invite re, uh, you again or, or re-challenge you again to respect some of the, uh, the, the, the power and the value of what we call this Network 21 system. I think the Amway side of the business is a pretty obvious one. The Amway Corporation these days is so big. The product line is so amazing. You just look at a simple program like what we call Drop and Shop. Most of you would know about that in here. Where we found the easiest way to gain retail customers in our business, just take the product and loan it to somebody for a couple of days and let them try it. 
why would you want to agonize over a whole bunch of complicated sales skills that most people find awkward, particularly with people they know, to sit down and say, well, Mary, let me tell you the five features and benefits of artistry. Yeah. You know, you don't want that relationship with your cousin and your next-door neighbor. It's weird. It's awkward. But we just say, hey, Mary, we've got this phenomenal, you know, just try it. It's just so much simpler. And the statistics we found with, like, 80% of the people that try it with almost no instruction at all want to know how they can get it. That, to me, is so remarkable. I was talking to somebody. I was talking to Dana. Was it you guys I was talking to the other day? Saying, isn't it bizarre? I mean, as much as we love the product, it never surprises me that somebody loves a product that gets educated about artistry, all the research behind artistry, all the, you know, we, we're around. I've been to the, you know, we've been to the, where they make it. We, we, we've been to Neutralite. We've been to the farms. We know all the research behind Neutralite. No wonder we like it. You know, we understand there's really nothing like it out there. And it's our business, so of course we like it. But what's amazing to me is you hand it to somebody who has no emotional attachment to it. In fact, worse, they've got an emotional attachment to something else. They're watching celebrities talk about something else, TV ads talk about something else, magazines talk about something else. we got a brand nobody's ever heard of, even though it's one of the top in the world. Who can imagine that Neutralite could be the leading brand of supplements in the world by like five to one, and nobody's ever heard of it? I mean, that's hilarious. And, and so when you take a product like that with all the quality we have that we don't even take time to explain and just have somebody try it and have 80% of them come back and say, I want more of that, you know you don't have to worry much about whether the product works, and you certainly don't have to worry much about whether the plan works when you're, you know, when you're dealing with, a, with an $8 billion entity with a, what, a 3 to 4 million IBOs in 60 to 80 different countries and territories around the world for five decades. Like, really, you're going to now suddenly discover something that 4 million people, 50 years of experience and $8 billion in sales hasn't figured out yet? I doubt it. I doubt you're going to just suddenly stumble onto the fact, aha, there's a, there's a flaw in that plan somewhere. Really? Uh, you know, but I, I'm not trying to be insulting, but people, it's funny how, how people come in and say, well, I've got to check it all out. It's almost funny. No, I don't say that because that would be rude and insulting. I just think to myself, that really is kind of funny. Uh, you, you know what else is funny? How few people ever ask me how I do, how, how, how it works. But, you know, isn't it funny? We, we kind of think like if anybody, when you know what we know, we think if anybody knew what we knew, of course they'd want to do it. But it's not true. Lots of people know the business works. They know we've made a lot of money. They know how we live. They know how we travel. They know, how, they know all that. Why don't they ask us? Because they think they know either. They either think that we like have this route of door-to-door salespeople or whatever they think. I don't know what they think. Or I think what really truth is, I think they either think they, they can't do it because they don't have the right personality, or they think we got in at the top of the pyramid or something. You know, like, like if you got in early enough, but you know, Dornos have taken it's done, that one's done. And it's just fascinating to me. Why not ask? But they don't ask. It's such a wonderful business, a wonderful life. But there are some secrets. They're not secrets because we don't keep them secret. But there are some things that are not obvious. There's some things that people don't realize. There's some fundamentals in what we do in Network 21 that have a lot more value than some of you realize. And that, you know, as we talk in these meetings, as you listen on CDs, I hope you start to pick that up. First of all, we have to say a couple things. It depends on what size business you want. If you're here and you're, you're pretty new and you're still kind of trying to f- feel your way around as to how much do you want, let me just share with you a couple of quick things. Number one, to build a really big business doesn't necessarily take any more time to build a small one. So be careful you don't sell yourself short just because you think it would take way too much commitment, way too much time. Uh, not necessarily so. Remember, this is a business of duplication. It's such an amazing concept that if you can do, say, we like to build a base around somewhere around 150 or 300 points a month from your own business, your own circle, as we call it. That means what you use and what you market is typically not more than 150 to 300 for about 90% of the active people in the business globally. I mean, this is an $8 billion company. Basically, less than 5% of the people, probably less than 2% of the people ever do more than 300 points a month or 400, some number in there. It's a very small number that does more than that. Most people do 50 to 150 to maybe 300 points. The reason it gets big is because you you find others who find others who find others who do that little tiny bit. So having a big business isn't necessarily any more work than having a small business. It just means you've done a better job of duplicating. And and, uh, get that straight because I find people all the time say, oh, I don't really want to do that much. You know, sometimes you can build a big business with less time than it takes to build a small business. 
If you learn to leverage, if you learn to duplicate, if you learn how to share this opportunity with the right people, you, can, you could find 10, you could stumble into 10 people over the next 90 days that would try it, and if those 10 all find another 10, you've got 100 people already. If they just do 100 points a month, you already qualified at 7,500. If you do that every month, you're probably going to make forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in the next 12 months. That's just finding 10 who find 10 who do 100 or 2. It's just not that complicated. The only time you're spending is the time it takes you to find the 10 and the time it takes you to do the 150, which in many cases is nothing more than drop shipping to a few clients. It's just, just don't let it overwhelm you, all right? So the Amway side is really fairly simple. It's the people side that becomes a little more complex. And so Network 21 was started to try to create some organizations to almost franchise the development of the people network. That's really what Network 21 was designed to do. It, it, it has resources, which means CDs and videos and websites and things that bring together the combined intellectual property and ex success experience of thousands of people, if not. Uh, we have hundreds of people in Network 21 globally that have built to the diamond level. We have hundreds of people like that that, that speak into those CDs and talk about what they did, how, what didn't work, what did work, what tips do they have, how did they fail, what kind of people were they, how did they get started, all kinds of things that kind of fill you with knowledge and belief and, and perspective and make you more effective when you're talking to other people. Because if you've heard 10 CDs, and, and as an engineer and a doctor and a, and a student and a retiree and a truck driver and whatever, and you run into somebody who says, well, I could never do that, and you're thinking, yes, you could. I just listened to a CD about somebody just like you. Somebody just as busy as you, just as single as you, with just as many kids as you, just as old as you, just as uneducated or overeducated or whatever it is, the more of those CDs you hear, the more you realize, huh, yes, they probably could do it. They just don't realize it yet. So it makes you more effective. The meetings make you effective because they, you know, they not only make you effective, but they help to lift the, the belief and knowledge of, of the people that are on your team so you don't have to do it. I mean, if you don't know how to give the seminar Kale and Outer are going to give today, who cares? You can put a ticket in somebody's hand and they get the seminar anyway. And if they miss this seminar, it might come out on CD in a, in a, in a few weeks or a month, and they'll at least get some of it. It's never the same. CDs are great. They have advantages. You can listen to them more than once if you miss something. But they're not the same as being in the room with the speaker, meeting the speaker, looking in their eyes, sensing the body language, feeling the energy in the room. That's different than a CD. So we have both. But we also have some fundamental principles, which we don't have time today. But I want, what I want to do is give you, um, I want to try to challenge you to respect the fact that what we've done around the world through Network 21 is nothing short of phenomenal, and it was not an accident. There are some things that we have taught that are not in the Amway kit. You want to learn how to build a network to platinum and make 10, 20, 30, 40,000, oh, 500,000 a year, pick a number. You've got to talk to somebody who's done that. And that's on the Network 21 educational systems where that information is. So there, there's a partnership here between Network 21, you personally as the owner of your business, uh, Amway Corporation, and then what we call your upline team, which is the people that have a vested financial interest in whether you succeed or not. Remember, your upline team, your upline leader, whoever that is, kind of a weird term if you're new, but that's the person who can get the 4% only if you get to 7,500 points. So they're going to be trying to figure out any possible way they can to help you. They're going to try to help you find people, help, help get the volume, make sure you're profitable, answer your questions. But they're not going to do it for you because that's not how our business works. We, don't, we, we, we build our own business with the help of others and the environment created by Network 21, the resources that allow you to, to, to maybe give um, some of the most talented people's um, message you, you can give it to anybody in your group without having to call that person up and hire them for an hour to go do it. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to find out what that would cost. And so, um, so we have a couple of things that are foundational, just so you know if you haven't heard them lately. We have something called CORE, which is really simply a few things that we have found. If you duplicate these things, you will have a much stronger business than if you only duplicate the ordering and selling of product. Uh, let me repeat that. It looks obvious that all you do is you order product, you sell product, and you, and you recruit other people who do the same thing. Seems like that, yes. But if you only do that and there's no other glue to pull it together, if the only activity people do is selling and using, we find that you end up replacing people pretty regularly if you do that. So what we learned years ago, and guess how we learned it? We learned years ago that it's, the business has a lot more glue, a lot more stability, a lot more security, and it's a much more effective business if the people that you bring in have a certain level of activity that they duplicate that's more than just product, 
and a certain, certain attitudes they duplicate, and certain relationships that are built. So very quickly, the core, which you can learn about later if you don't know about it, it just has to do with being willing to do you know, the, the 150 points a month at least through personal use and, and retail clients, showing the plan a couple of times a week, and, and, and getting involved with the educational programs and the environment that we have and being part of a team. And if you duplicate that, they're all things that anyone can do. They don't require a bunch of skill or major commitment. They're basically just decisions you make. You decide to use the product. You decide you're willing to show the plan. You decide you'll show up at a meeting or listen to some CDs. And if you duplicate that, you get a much different business than if you just duplicate orderers, shoppers, or even plan showers. Because there's something about bringing people together where they can really really uh, learn and harvest and build uh, trust and relationships. So you have to trust me on that one for a minute. So we have this thing called a core, we have a thing called a 15 planner, and we have a thing called a pace setter. That's kind of our little basic activity engagement test. And you only need, here's the good news, you only need about um, 30 or 40 of those in your business, and you'll, ha- you'll probably be, in our experience, at 7,500 points. You put 40, 40 or 50 of those people down, you know, put like 10, 10 or 20 in each of three or four teams and you'll have it, all right? Now, in addition to that, you know, we have other things that we build the Network 21 Foundation on. We have uh, things what we call edification, counseling, and no cross-lining, kind of weird terms. Edification simply means we've learned that most of us aren't successful enough or effective enough at promoting ourselves. We can't tell people why we're smart and they should listen to us. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't work in life. So what we've learned is if we work as a team, you can promote your upline who does have more experience and knowledge than you, and people will be more apt to listen to someone that you promote because they trust you and they're successful. So you promote them, they listen to them, you're the messenger, not the expert. And then the more they learn to trust the upline who's successful, the upline then can re-endorse you and help your people to more willing to listen to you as they begin to see that you're following the same pattern as the successful people. This is all a science that really helps to reinforce your your effectiveness because we help you become more effective because we give you credibility you can't give yourself. We have ability for you to counsel or be coached by somebody who will guide you and help you and not just say, good luck, make all the mistakes you want, you know, let us know if you succeed. We actually do that. And then we have this principles where we respect each other's um, family and, and, and business, and we don't interfere with each other. We can safely attend meetings all over the world, and if you're part of a different group, it, but you're part of the Network 21 family, then we all respect each other. We all teach the same kind of things. We don't, like, steal each other, confuse each other, discourage each other, complain to each other. You know, we, we keep those things within our family so that everyone feels positive and, and safe and, and respected, and there's not a bunch of people running around trying to poach other people's people, and that just doesn't happen. But it, was by, it wasn't by accident. It, you know, it, it doesn't happen because we all respect each other. We all agree mutually to protect each other and to respect each other's business. And then we develop a structure, a strategy for structure, and we very simply try to get you to begin a process of building these teams to where your ultimate goal, this clear picture I was talking about at the beginning, is to get just three or four teams of people that are at what we call Leaders Club and to get each of those teams to be three or four deep in Leaders Club. And when you've got that, you have such a strong business, you won't, you hardly know what to do with yourself. Believe it or not, with just ten people, three or four wide and three or four deep of Leaders Club. And a Leaders Club is something that anyone in this room, if you're not already, could do in the next 30 days, 60 days at most. It simply means setting up three teams, getting to 1,000 points, and a couple of other things that aren't very complicated. It's not a big deal. But if, believe it or not, anyone who decides to build the business generally will reach Leaders Club within their first month or two of activity. And if you can just get three or four deep in this group, three or four deep in this group, three or four deep in this group, boom, you'll find yourself at 7,500 points. It's just not that complicated. So that means we bring everything back down to core and Leaders Club. If you accept core as a habit pattern and you'll do it, that's what we'll duplicate. If you go Leaders Club and then help other people go Leaders Club, you will be able to build a very strong and profitable business with, with um, building blocks that, are, that, are, uh, that have a foundation of structural foundation and an educational foundation that will allow them to build and get very, very big without ever worrying about it falling apart because all the little building blocks are strong. They all have some width. 
They all have volume, and they all have some education in those little units. And that's why as we move ahead to the, the big focus we have right now, we're looking for our, our next big events in Network 21 are these three flagship things we do each year, the weekend conferences. We call it Winter Conference. It usually comes in January in, in North America. And these things are uh, the flagship of what drives our business forward. We have found the easiest way to get a huge business is learn how to sell two things. Learn how to sell appointments, meaning convince people to sit down and look at it. Not sell the business, sell appointments. There's a difference. We try to separate those two. Don't try to talk people into the business. It doesn't work anyway. Just try to convince them it's worth sitting down and looking at it. Sell appointments and sell tickets. Tickets? What about products? You'll sell plenty of products. That won't be a problem. That's never a problem. We never have to have seminars on creating volume. If people start brushing their teeth, eating the vitamins, putting some makeup on. They use it. They share it. The volume will come. That we, we already have programs for that. Uh, core challenges you to do at least 150 points a month. And we'd like you to develop 50 of those points from retail clients. But the real power is, as I'm talking about, as you, as you begin to see, if you can sell appointments, meaning if you can get people in front of the plan of the products, and then out of the people that get in front of the plan of the products, get as many as possible to come to something. A BBS is a good start. A weekend is much better. And we find the people, here's the challenges we tend to do all over the world. They're based around one of two things. They're either based around becoming leaders club, so that you can always be coming as a leaders club, then bring in a new leaders club. Then you move on to executive leaders club, you bring another new leaders club. And you move on to Quicksilver, you bring an executive leaders club, and then you bring another leaders club. It's just, just always looking for that next little building block, which isn't that complicated. And we're running big challenges around the world right now. You're going to start seeing a lot more here where we're suggesting the real fundamental building block of Network 21 is people that can get 20 or more at a weekend spread over at least three teams. If you haven't got to that point yet, make that, I would challenge you to make that as a, a goal. If not for winter conference, at least by summer conference. Start thinking in terms of, I want to, I want to, first I want to come as a leaders club with at least 10. Then I want to come with at least 20 in at least three teams. And then I can't even imagine what, if you even have any idea what your life will look like when you start bringing three teams that have 20 people in them. You figure out how to get 20 to a weekend across three teams, and you help three of your legs get somebody in them that has 20 to a weekend. You'll be sitting there with 60 or 75 people at the weekend. You'll probably be running 10, 12,000 points a month. You run those guys just one more step up to platinum. Now you have three legs at platinum, and if, with a little proper structure, which I won't bore you with right now, a little side volume, you get those three legs to 7,500. And right now, with the current bonuses that are in place, you're looking at a $150,000 to $175,000 or more a year in income. And it's all based on core, then to Leaders Club and this 20-plus base, and they just duplicate it, duplicate it. And nobody's doing any more than using it, dropping, shopping it, and showing the plan and selling tickets. It's just that simple, not necessarily easy, but just that simple. And if you'll tie it in all together, not just the products, not just the meetings, but the package, that's what Network 21 brings. We do it the same all over the world, all learning from the same strategy, same core, the same everything. It's the same. It's the same in Russia. It's the same in China. It's the same in India. Same in Australia. It's the same in Africa. It's fascinating. Our people can go anywhere. They can recruit people anywhere. The products are the same. The plan's the same. Network 21 training's the same. And you, you've got the whole world as your playground. But you start right here with commitment to core, commitment to Leaders Club, and commitment to the next 